Hello everyone, and welcome to my panel, Law and Order Equestria. And no, this won't be tracking one crime down and then having a lot of people shouting in the courtroom. That's dramatic, but I'm not sure it's for me. No, instead, I am here to talk about the idea of crime and punishment, and what purpose does punishment serve? And who am I? Why, I am the Silver Quill. Hello everyone. Good to see you. So I hope you're having a fine day this weekend, and once again, I want to thank all the folks at BabsCon for making this possible. Now, pardon me as I am multitasking. I need to make sure that I am uh, able, that I am seeing people's comments as I work. So let's see what is going on on YouTube. This is a fun little setup. I've got streaming. I've got a tablet to keep an eye on the comments. This is the technological world we live in, and it's what I've been doing for weeks. Uh, in the absence of social interaction. So, but the reason I need to be looking off to the side is because I need to keep it on my PowerPoint. Aha! So here we are, talking about equestrian justice, or sometimes people would argue the lack thereof. Because this has been the thing throughout mm, all the seasons in my eyes, uh, including, but not limited to, uh, Discord's Reformation, Flim and Flam consistently getting away with stuff. And then, of all things, Starlight Glimmer. I think that uh, the end of season, yeah, season five, was where people started to really question the pony policy of basically making a friend of all your antagonists and uh, combating their actions by making them friends. But it carried the other problem, they never faced a consequence for those actions. And it carried forward. I mean, Chancellor Nese, that was not a good track record. Uh, an international incident opposing princesses, uh, basically physically assaulting representatives from other nations when he uh, chained them together with magical bindings. And a blatant uh, pony-centric philosophy. So I remember when, uh, when what was it, season six? No, season eight ended. People were saying... You know, why is he not facing any consequences for his behavior? But at the same time, while he was getting off the hook, it seemed, Cozy Glow, whoa, she got a consequence, a great deal of consequence. Sealed in Tartarus. And she's just a filly, or so we thought. And this, too, sparked a lot of debate and some pretty uh, extreme reactions. We didn't forgive her! <laughs> Very extreme reactions. Uh, put simply, folks were starting to realize that maybe it's okay to show a bad, a bad character or a villainous character facing consequence for their actions. So what about Discord, who in our final season triggered the pony apocalypse? He was the cause behind much of the misfortune, which impacted a lot of lives. And while he was penitent, while he was uh, very sorry in expressing that he had the best of intentions, that doesn't diminish the fact that his actions had terrible consequences and nearly brought about the end of Equestria. Yet at the same time, there was equal parts horror that, well, okay, Chrysalis and T-Rex didn't really, uh, they didn't get a lot of sympathy. But Cozy Glow, you just petrified what we still think of as a child. Again, I have debating points on that. But it is a question, why are they receiving this full punishment, but Discord seemingly getting off the hook and that is a problem so we're going to look at the idea of punishment and what it serves but of course equestria is a fictional land it's a very idealized land and so i'm faced with a challenge of who do i look to to talk about this well thankfully there's some very real world uh, perspective that we can draw upon because this is a topic that is been going on well before our time it will happen long after our time and thankfully, through the written word and other media, we have now perspective of people who've come before. One of whom I imagine is very familiar to you all. C.S. Lewis, both student and teacher at Oxford University and Cambridge University. And of course, he is the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. But what is not always known is that he also published a lot of papers and uh, presentations on ethics and morality. And uh, in fact, if you go to YouTube and do a search for C.S. Lewis animated, 
uh, people have taken his uh, transcriptions and basically added narration and some pretty fantastic animation to give a visual presentation. I recommend it. It's a lot of fun and probably one of the best ways to get a peek into his thoughts. But I also acknowledge that he is from, he was, is from before my time. We have some modern context as well. Jeffrey G. Murphy, Regents Professor of Law and Philosophy at Arizona State University. He has published a tremendous number of articles and books talking about uh, the crime and punishment system and basically the ethics thereof. Why are we doing this? What is the goal? When is a punishment too much? And what if a punishment is not enough? Which can be a very difficult question to tackle. So I'm going to be drawing on them and a few others to talk about the idea of uh, punishment and what does it serve? What's the end goal? So, and one of the first and most obvious uh, versions, or one of the first goals of punishment is a sense of retribution. You have committed a wrong, and therefore there is a punishment that follows. We have crime and justice system at its most simplified is that idea. But there's always the question of how much punishment should someone receive? And because of that, there are actually two types of retribution in effect. First is grievance retribution. Retribution. Retributivism. It's quite the mouthful. Grievance retributivism. And for an easy example of that, that's Tyrek. He came to Equestria intent on stealing all the magic, and he was banished to Tartarus for his crime. He committed his crime. He was imprisoned. Very straightforward. Grievance retributivism is punishment is deserved for responsible, wrongful acts. There's a, a saying, I think Joseph Campbell said, everything we do is evil for someone. It's the law of unintended consequences. But responsible wrongful acts, where you intentionally set out to harm someone, when you intentionally acted in defiance of a law, well, that is your responsibility, and the punishment follows. And here's the thing. While we may not be able to say, if someone is guilty, that is not our domain, that is the domain for the courts, every person, by virtue of being a human being, has a right to say if a punishment is deserved. In fact, C.S. Lewis was very firm on this, that all punishment must be weighed in terms of dessert. And no, I'm not talking about a delicious after-dinner meal. I'm talking about, did you really deserve this? There are going to be other com competing, maybe conflicting goals with punishments, but his argument is, no, this must be the one and only means of judging a punishment, if it is worthy, if you really deserve what's happening. Now, there's another form of retributivism, character retributivism, which is actually has less to do with what you do and more with the quality of your own character. One's deserts are, not a are a function not merely of one's wrongful acts, but also the ultimate state of one's character. And for that, we have both Starlight Glimmer and Trixie. Uh, in, this, in No Second Prances, much of Ponyville was shunning Starlight, or at least whispering behind her back, and Trixie, while she might have been oblivious to it, uh, she was acknowledging that she understood the hostility. For the citizens of Equestria, these two are were cruel, especially for Ponyville, for Trixie, as she <laughs> conquered them. So their judgment has more to do with their quality character. And one of the running critiques of My Little Pony has always been that you can do some pretty horrible acts, but as long as you're a nice pony, everything's fine by the next episode. However, if you've got a really rotten personality, you were treated as public enemy number one for far, far less grievous a crime. Case in point with Trixie, uh, remember Boastbusters. Everyone was talking about what a miserable pony she was, but it was Snips and Snails who brought the Ursa Minor to Ponyville. Why everyone was blaming Trixie and in No Second Prances, why that is part of the grudge seems, well, disproportionate. Again, this is me exercising the right to say whether or not I think a punishment is deserved or if it's too extreme. So we have two forms of punishment going, one that might judge you simply by the actions, one that might go more by quality of character. And it's important, to quote Jeffrey Murphy, impose on the criminal the level of suffering deserved, that is, a level of suffering properly proportional to the wrongfulness of their criminal conduct. And that sounds pretty simple, very straightforward. But then we take a look at modern society 
And how are we punishing people? Because it's not just a simple case of, oh, the courts decide your guilt or innocence and then you are punished. No, there's always more. And for that, we must reach beyond Pony and explore another character. Scott. Of, the, of Ant-Man. I'm sure many people have seen uh, the Ant-Man movie. And there's this great scene where he's just out of prison. He's picked up by his friend and his friend is saying, hey, uh, you know that convicts don't get a lot of job offers. And Scott has this electrical engineering. He's not like those other inmates. He's going to be just fine. And then we smash cut to him working at a, a Baskin Robbins. And I don't mean this as a diss against anyone who works for Baskin Robin. The more of the humor lies in the simple frustration of his expectations and bravado, not necessarily a job of which he's landed, but he had to lie to get this job. He had to omit the fact that he served time uh, in prison just so he could get hired uh, for a job that, let's be honest, an electrical engineering degree might come in handy with maintenance on the machines, but by and large, a lot of what he's worked for is not going to apply. He aimed for a different field and was basically forced, the choice made for him, to go into this job. So here's the thing. He's still being punished. He served his time. Uh, if you watch the extras, he did an interview from a prison uh, holding cell. And when he got upset, he got tased. So he, he's definitely suffered, suffered isolation from his family physical uh, punishment in the form of electrocution and now he thinks he served his time it's time to keep it's time to start over well he's not being allowed that opportunity because he's still being punished and so we go back to Jeffrey Murphy's talk about a level of suffering properly proportional to the wrongfulness of the conduct is this proportional that he is still being denied opportunities having already served his time and that's a hard question to answer. The second concept of a punishment is, to, is deterrence, which more or less goes to a system of threats. Twilight excels at outlining a system of threats because her paranoia about what could happen takes over her imagination. As we saw in A Bird in the Hoof, she's very good at saying what Celestia might do to Fluttershy. She might banish you to the dungeon, or she'll banish you from Equestria or put you in a dungeon as she banishes you from Equestria. And this is still a rather iconic moment as it just looks so dark. I mean, dang. But uh, basically, Twilight knows that there's a consequence to wrongful acts. But we see this in other shows as well. Case in point, the Powerpuff Girls. A public punishment helps others to recognize the limit of their own power and discourage similar misconduct. Well, in one episode, Blossom, this is of the G1 Powerpuff Girls, she gave into temptation and stole a set of golf clubs to gift to the professor. She couldn't afford them otherwise. They'd been knocked over in a crime and were basically lying there in the open. And she just gave in impulsively. And so by the end, actually, there's a moment where uh, even the mayor is saying, no, this is a first time offense. He asked the chief of police, maybe we can take it easy on her. And the chief says, no. No, she, no, no uh, freebies, no second chances. You do a crime, you, com you commit a crime, you do the time. And so she is sentenced to hours of community service. And basically, it's all to serve that no one is above the law. No one is above punishment for their actions. And so the idea is, if you see someone else taking a, a, a punishment for a crime... You might think, well, I better not make that mistake. I don't want to end up like that. That is, argued, one very important part of our own criminal justice system. And even on a social, uh, on a social context, if we see someone who's being socially punished, ostracized, uh, we realize, okay, that behavior is not acceptable. We take our cues from other people's mistakes. But there's an objection to this. And not just... Wait, don't you think that's a little extreme? Again, we are always left with the option of saying, was that proportional to the wrong committed? There's the Kantian objection, made, coined by Thomas Kant. He's, say, he's arguing that deterrence is actually a very inhumane policy because you are ignoring the individual and instead using them to produce social benefit. They are, you are turning someone into a tool for your agenda. 
ignoring their humanity. And people would say, oh, can't you just ignore that? And he said, I can't. I can hear you booing in the distance, don't worry. So there is that question. If you are using someone's wrongdoing as an opportunity to express to the larger public, are you being harsher on that person than is warranted? Are you perhaps using this opportunity and ignoring the justice that they are owed? Because deter deterrence is statistically based, not morally. And this is important. This is why C.S. Lewis was so adamant that you have to argue punishment from the position of deserts. If you were to talk to a statistician and say, look, this crime, it was awful, but this punishment is even worse. You're, you're making this huge display of this person, dragging them through the mud. They'll never be able to recover from this. This is immoral. And the statistician might cock their head at you and say, who said anything about morals? Here, look at this uh, report. Just from this one punishment, crime has decreased by 5%. They're going to argue the impact. And now you're arguing across purposes. Morality is not part of that chart. Side note for writing, this is a fantastic way to get car character conflict. It's one thing if two characters are arguing about the same topic, butting heads, they both want to do the right thing, but they don't agree on what the right thing is. But if characters are arguing at completely cross purposes, that is a fantastic way to cause an impasse and a great means for character conflict. But there is a question. If you're arguing the efficacy of a punishment, morality isn't going to factor because we don't ask if it's, uh, if it's moral. We ask if it's effective. We also ask, could punishment cause a reformation? Plato was very adamant about arguing for this. He uh, took the position that the goal of punishment shouldn't even be to punish. It shouldn't be uh, payback. It should be the governing moral improvement. The governing principle should be moral improvement. Get You punish someone much like you would punish a child for a wrongful act. You see, that was not the right thing to do. Okay, you're going into timeout. I realize that sounds condescending to people who are actually serving time in prison or, su or suffered similar penalties. But for Plato, it was letting someone know they'd done wrong. And then the funny thing is that it's not even about making them go along. He, I don't think he'd agree with the definition of deterrence as a system of threats. What he's arguing for is that punishment will instill virtue of doing what's right for the sake of the fact that it is right. Once you know that something you did was wrong, it's possible to reflect and say, okay, this would have been the right thing to do. This would have been the better uh, path. And with that knowledge, you are, better, you are an improved person to tackle the future. Compliance with the law is just a byproduct of instilling this virtue. I think to Plato, he viewed that laws must be just so that just people can adhere to them as a byproduct. Simply following the law because it is a law doesn't work, doesn't fly so well. This leads to the parentalistic theory, which is a part of Reformation. Again, I used uh, the idea of putting a kid in time out. Well, think about Apple Bloom, who has probably had to apologize multiple, multiple times. <laughs> if only for the pony she uh, put on the crosshairs in her cutie mark hunt. But I'm thinking of the cutie pox episode where she apologizes to Zakura because, again, in a moment of weakness and temptation, she stole, a, what was it, a potion, which in turn caught, led to a big blow up. And she understands if she's about to get punished and be denied uh, time with Sakura. But Zakura's answer is that, don't be silly, you're always welcome, and every mistake you make helps you become a better you. This is the idea that uh, an ideal, in an ideal society with an ideal uh, law system, it's all about personal growth, which is very difficult. Uh, the paternalistic theory and, and uh, Plato's view on this relies very heavily on ideals. And ideals are, are stars by which we navigate. They're not uh, a road in which we can easily walk. You may never reach that ideal. But this is what the theory relies upon. If the culture is just, if the uh, rules are just, then the just will comply and they'll be drawn more towards virtue. 
And that's why I think that Princess Celestia is a good example of the paternalistic theory. She is presented as a just ruler and idealized. She has personal quirks that we see later in the seasons, but from the very start, you got the sense that this was a ruler who genuinely cared about her subjects, and she took action when she felt that there was uh, an injustice or an imbalance. When Fluttershy stole Philomena, with the best of intentions, Celestia said, I, you could have asked me and been saved all this trouble. There was no punishment just letting her know that asking first will save you a world of trouble, because that would make Fluttershy a better individual, whereas a punishment might only make her intimidated of Celestia, actually causing a rift, not governing by fear. Oh, I just want to give a shout out to Jonah Seaman, who did boo at my pun. I appreciate that. But again, we're assuming that every law itself is just. And again, I, Equestria, I do consider a land of ideals. There are problems. There are always someone trying to take advantage of a rule, exploit a weakness. But in this idealized land, they rarely, if ever, get away with it. And if they do, there's a separate consequence. Which can also, I think that's also why we as fans are eager to see a character who does wrong be punished. After certain episodes like Sweet and Elite, uh, I heard people mention frustration that Rarity never received a consequence for being tempted to ditch her friends or not giving them the attention to which she promised. Because we watch this show, we recognize an ideal, and we'd like to see that ideal carried out, even in little ways. And that set the stage for the bigger problems of ponies like Starlight Discord, Flim and Flam, Naysay, the list goes on and on. But this is the thing, this ties back into the idea of uh, deterrence being statistical. If you're valuant based on the ability to instill virtue, morality might not be the number one factor, and desert might not be the number one factor. We are asking for this to cure a person's vices or cure a society's a temptation and a cure is uh, defined by its uh, ability well ability to fix things is it effective not is it moral you've heard the old phrase a cure is worse than the, the disease well yeah it feels worse uh, than the disease but you're better after so you'll endure it but when you're judging something by its effect and not by whether it's deserved it's possible to open the door to the dark side of Reformation. In fact, it can actually be quite terrifying uh, when you think about what happens when the goal is to fix others rather than to be, than to give what is deserved. Case in point, Tira came, uh, again, a grievance retributivism. He's in prison for his crimes. But if he, what if he's there to give him time to reflect and reform? What was his sentence? He's imprisoned in Tartarus, okay. How long is it fair for him to be in uh, Tartarus? How long is he to wait there before he is let go and returned to his homeland? Are they gonna hold him indefinitely? Was his crime that grievous? And do, they ha and do the ponies have the right to keep the prince of a royal family from another nation in captivity indefinitely? That's where it gets a little tricky. Now, if Celestia said, now if Celestia were to say, oh, he's undergoing this until he realizes the error of his ways, some might be tempted to say, oh, okay, and it ends at that, but then he's still imprisoned for an indeterminate time. Is that what he deserves? Believe me, I got no love for the guy, uh, other than loving him have conflict with the uh, other members of the triad. But I'm not sympathetic to him, but I, I start to say, hang on. Is this the right thing to do? Well, someone would say, well, it doesn't matter if it's the right thing to do. Is it, a, is it the effective thing to do? And this was what was driving Starlight Glimmer. Remember, when we were first introduced to her, she would, sit, she would uh, talk about the reformation process, the normalization. Basically, everything's a natural step. And these are important uh, means to that end. Don't worry, it's going to work out in the end. Thus, she could keep them, uh, she could keep the main six completely captive until they came around to her line of thinking. It's all a normal part of the process. And it works. It worked on party favor. 
Look at how quickly he got back in line once he was freed from his isolation with megaphones blaring uh, Starlight's philosophy and the guilt complex she gave him just before locking the door. Believe me, again, I view Celestia as ideal. I believe that she does act for the good of her subjects and the larger world. It's very possible that T-Rex was kept longer, but his sentence was upcoming. Or perhaps there was another reason she couldn't let him go, aside from the obvious magic dream. With Starlet, however, she thinks she's doing the right thing. And in her mind, this is the most effective way to do it. Therefore, did the other points deserve this? Doesn't matter. It's outside of her view. Which also raises a question. Uh, I've long railed against the Reformation spell. And I've also raised critique of Cadence's love spell. And in every little thing she does, we witness Starlight make uh, the main five go along with her plans and uh, suggestions simply by taking advantage of a spell. Which is uh, quite horrifying in my eyes. But that raises a question. Why not use magic to fix a problem? If someone is acting in a way that is both self-destructive and detrimental to others, and you have this means of uh, correction, w wouldn't that be more effective and maybe even uh, more humane than imprisoning them? What if Celestia had used a Reformation spell on Tyrik? And I know that folks might argue, this is a fantasy show for kids, uh, set in a magical world. But I want to put this out there. We are developing new technology and learning more about people every day. We're learning more about the mind. We learn more about uh, psychiatric treatments. We learn more about uh, interactions with the world. So whenever new technology arises, we are often running behind on how to evaluate the morality and implementation of this technology. And that includes uh, the justice system. I mean, DNA evidence has been hotly debated, and it was not always a thing. In fact, for a while, I think it was very unsure. We always have to reevaluate. So there may come a day when a new means of treatment is available for someone who has gone through a crime. And we have to ask ourselves, is this what they deserve? And is this the right thing to do? Others will, well, others will argue this would be very effective. But that leads to another topic, uh, partly due to uh, Reformation, but also due to the concept of mercy. Basically, there's the argument of the environment from which a person commits a crime is an influence on their actions. And if they're put in an unfair situation, uh, can you really hold them fully accountable? Case in point, C.S. Lewis made uh, an art, published an article in response to a humanist editorial on a man who was put in prison for a determined amount of time and was going to be released. He served his sentence, but he was going to be released right back into an environment that gave rise to a reliance on crime, poverty that uh, necessitated going beyond the law, and basically a fear that the process was just going to repeat over because you released someone right back in the situation that caused the problem in the first place. And Lewis, uh, this was where he coined... Uh, much of his argument that dessert is, can be the only determining factor. Now, for a more contextual version, we have uh, the episode A Matter of Principles. Discord. This one, in some ways, could be worse than his mistake with the triad and putting uh, Equestria on the, on the path to destruction. He didn't mean to do that. Everything he did in this episode was intentional. So is this worse, even though the damage is on a smaller scale? There's a that might have more to do with character retributivism. That's hard to say, and I just try to say it as fast as I can. Retributivism. You try it. But then we get a weird moment. Starlight taps into her counselor role and says, I realize you were upset that you'd been left out of the opening of this school and no one asked you to take part, even though you're our friend. And so I apologize for that. And that catches Discord off guard. And he's just not sure how to react to that. His, his uh, torment campaign suddenly stops. But then Starlight says, I'd like to offer you the role of, vi of uh, Vice Head Mayor. No. Yeah, Vice Head Mayor. 
And this is where things go wrong for this episode, in my opinion. Because the students and their anger and confusion at this, I think, is highly warranted. Through his actions, which were intentional, Discord put a lot of ponies not only at risk of just ruining a scavenger hunt as part of their education, but in actual physical danger. And he's being rewarded for that. So when all the students are saying, no, come on, I'm totally confused. Yeah, they have every right to do so. Because right now, Starlight is saying uh, that Discord is a victim of other people's treatment. And that's not wrong. It was an oversight to leave him out. It was uh, unfortunate that no one really offered him a chance to talk and maybe share things from a former antagonist perspective. But their mistakes don't justify his actions. And uh, Jeffrey Murphy argues that as part of their dignity as human beings, or in Equestria sentient beings, transgressors must be seen as responsible agents and not merely helpless victims. It seems paradoxical, but the argument is you respect someone as an individual with the autonomy of choice. Even if they're coming from a bad situation, they have the choice to travel a very difficult path. They chose to commit a crime, and that is still their choice. However, before it sounds like I'm assigning a solo uh, viewpoint to uh, Murphy, he also argues that when a crime is committed, it is society's responsibility to look at how it might have been g given rise. Could this have been prevented if, uh, well, you took better care of a community? That is a calling to improve. At the same time, it is not absolution of the act. So it's really trying to do two things at once, which is difficult and often very slow. But there is al there is always that responsibility for both the individual and the society. Ah, Sweetie Bloom is correcting me. Rather than sentient, it should be sapient beings. Though I'm going to have to look up the definition to understand the true difference. But I appreciate the correction. Which bring But this brings me back to why I am against pretty much any mind spell okay starlight and her uh and her spell that put the main five under her thrall that is horrible right there i mean she shouldn't have done it it's terrible that she goes f forward with it but what about the reformation spell or cadence's love spell reformation spell we don't really know how it works just that it exists and cadence's love spell i understand that it's done with a, a desire to achieve good it's done with the desire to help a couple and mend a rift that's forming between them. But I don't think that Cadence was respecting their right as individuals or as sapient individuals to handle their own problem. Instead, when she cast that love spell, she took away that autonomy of choice and the ability to work through that. By that same measure, if you zap someone with a spell to make them compliant, you're not respecting them as an individual or someone with the ability to choose. They are a light switch. You're evil. You're good. Evil, good. And in doing so, you've basically taken away anything that made them an individual. Now, and if you can zap them into being good, someone can zap them into being bad just as quickly. And that's why, I, again, it's the idea that perhaps down the road we'll have other means of uh, a punishment meant to be more effective but are you respecting someone as an individual and not simply using them as a tool? This all circles back to grievance retributivism, uh, character retributivism, and deterrence. But reformation also serves as a dialogue because it's not just the society saying to the individual, you have committed a wrong, this is your punishment. By accepting that punishment, an individual might say, I understand that I erred. I want to make up for this. One great example is, uh, oh, shoot, Gabby Gums. What was the name of that episode? It's escaping me at the moment. But uh, basically, the Cutie Mark Crusaders became, they started publishing a tell-all in their school newspaper. And in doing so, uh, they basically hurt everyone in town exposed all these secrets or, or embarrassments or made stuff up by taking pictures out of context. And in doing so, they, they hurt a lot of individuals. And for a time, they were ostracized. Nobody wanted to be around them. 
It wasn't until that they published a, a admission and retraction and apology to the community that all was made well. Now, I will say that the frustration the ponies exhibited towards a bunch of fillies, I think, was disproportionate. Like, Applejack not wanting to talk to them. Okay, proportionate. They, they lost her trust. Rainbow Dash dumping a rain cloud on top of them. Disproportionate. Ponyville Confidential. Thank you, N30. So yes, Ponyville Confidential showed that sometimes just admitting you done goofed is the first step to mending the rift. Recognizing a wrong committed and accepting punishment is declaring a restoration of the social bond. It can be a dialogue back and forth. And some people, realizing that they've erred, will want to accept their punishment uh, in order to reintegrate with society. Scott Lang in Ant-Man said, I served my time. I'm ready to start over and do better. But he was denied that chance because now suddenly it's no longer a dialogue. He's still getting punished in what some would argue is proportionate, some would argue is disproportionate. So, again, if we're dealing in ideals, then you accept a fair punishment and it sells the rift, and that's it. It's done. When Starlight, at the end of season six, no, no, sorry, season five, uh, when she accepted uh, her punishment, she was willing to do, she was willing to accept whatever the main six thought was fair. Key word there, what they thought was fair. And some might argue that because she received no punishment, it looks like she's actually being rewarded for her actions. She uh, imprisoned ponies, brainwashed a town, uh, magically assaulted royalty, and then caused a, uh, a time paradox that nearly destroyed the world. And what happens? Well, from the outsider perspective, she basically becomes Twilight's pupil. She's rewarded. Just as later, she would seem to reward Discord for his uh, antagonizing the students. So, in some ways, it might be that this was a case where My Little Pony avoided the ideal. They avoided a fair punishment. But I also want to raise something that seems a little weird. Starlight meddled with time and nearly doomed the world. But, how many uh, beings in Equestria are aware of those events truly? Twilight and Spike. Only they saw what happened. For everyone else, their memories reset, and for all intents and purposes, uh, Starlight's actions never happened. I mean, I think that's quibbling, but I want to bring this back to actual uh, debate in law. If, you, if someone were to attack with a weapon and take a life, the punishment for that is, is severe. Life imprisonment, uh, death penalty. There's a lot of debate about which is the worst. I was actually talking with a co-worker about this. Uh, I've never felt the rage that must come with losing someone you love to that violence. So I don't know, I can't say what's fair, but there are times I think imprisoning someone for life is much crueler and harsher than a death penalty. That might be death is too good for you. So there is that, but I wanna twist that scenario where there's an attack with a deadly weapon, but for whatever reason, the attacker misses. There is no harm done. The punishment for attempted assault is less severe, even though uh, uh, Murphy argues it is the same intent in both scenarios. The only difference is the outcome. In his eyes, that signals that our justice system, at least here in America, is that there's an element of revenge present. That we, if you commit a wrong and it has actual consequences, we want payback. If there was no harm, you still did wrong, but we're not going to be as, as eager for revenge. I don't strictly disagree that revenge is not, oh, I don't know, I'm using double negatives. Revenge may indeed be an element of our law system. It may be part of our philosophy. But I'd also argue that his scenario has one fundamental flaw. In the, sin, in the situation where the attacker misses, what happens next? Was this an attack uh, on in a moment of pure emotion and they realize what they were doing and are horrified? Uh, was it planned before? Did someone intervene? Did, did, the per, did the person being attacked fight back? In which case then it's suddenly a question of, okay, you are self-defense, but how far are you going in that defense? There's so many questions about what happens next that I don't think it's a good comparison. 
I'd argue it, that more it says we can only judge by what has happened because until we can truly understand people totally, if we could be able to actually understand people on a fundamental level, it's very hard to judge by anything other than the actions. So, again, what is fair? It, was it fair to punish Starlight for an event that technically never happened and only two ponies remember? Punishing her for the actions in the town, yeah, that is totally within, that is a totally different topic because there are multiple ponies who can attest to the impact it had on her. But only Twilight and Spike really experienced what, what Starlight's time travel had done and they chose to let it go. That's their choice. I still think Starlight should have done something to signal to the others her penance. I wish that they could have done a whole episode going of her going back to uh, her town to try and make amends. Not just the, br the brief clip at the end of season six and the uh, finale of season seven. But what about something like Chancellor Naysay? Because there's a fallacy that is very easy to give into. You think, okay, if someone is genuinely sorry for what they've done, they're not going to ask for any mercy. They're going to say, yeah, I'll accept whatever punishment. But that's a mistake to think. Not because it, 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 seem, it seems very reasonable at first, but it ignores something. And I think Naysay is a good example. He made a lot of mistakes and realized the error of his ways. Now, a fitting punishment might be you abused your station and basically set the policy, a very negative one, that has caused damage to the education system. A very, I think a reasonable punishment would be you are no longer a chancellor. You abuse, this, you abuse the position, you are denied. But Naysay might ask something like, I know I made a mistake, but I ask that I keep my position so that I can affect positive reform. And so, so there's an interesting question. If someone has erred and they want mercy, not so that they can get off the hook, but that they can actually uh, make things better, use that experience to improve and help others avoid the same mistake, is that a good solution? Or is that denying justice to other people, to those who were wronged by their actions? That's a hard call, especially case by case. Remember that the, one of the dangers of curative uh, punishment is that someone might go along with you just for the sake of getting out of it. They might become such a good liar. Uh, it's like Fluttershy getting out of Starlight's uh, imprisonment. She lied about her belief just so she could get out and be more and uh, undermine it. So you got to be sure. But I think Naysay was genuinely pen penitent for what he'd done and would want to make things better. So letting him keep it might actually be a good idea, or it might offend people. Which brings to the topic of mercy. And My Little Pony is, is chalked to the brim with that. One, this panel from a comic, I believe it was MLP number 25, a, a creature, darn, it's not like the siren. Actually, wait, it was a very, a Kelpie, yes. Thinking of the DuckTales uh, murder horses. A Kelpie tried to flood Ponyville to get water spirits from the river to the ocean. And t after she did this so by brainwashing Ponyville's residents, Twilight cut off any grudge or uh, retribution against this Kelpie, saying that she made the wrong choice, but she made it for the right reasons. She was trying to help her friends, and we've all done something silly for friends, right? Derpy Boru has turned this into a meme, basically swapping Rainbow Dash for any number of criminals, both real and fictional, and Twilight making an excuse for them. There is the argument made by C.S. Lewis that mer mercy, detached from justice, becomes unmerciful. Uh, mercy is meant to temper justice, not substitute for it, because when it's, again, that dark side of reformation. If you are uh, inflicting a punishment on someone to help them, and you won't stop until they're better, then suddenly justice out the window, your mercy is suddenly becoming a cruel act that is only viewed by yourself as merciful. Uh, in fact, Lewis made the argument that a tyrant is actually a better scenario than, some, than an ideologue uh, or zealot uh, acting on their morality because a tyrant can be satiated, distracted, they might take an off day. 
Someone who is acting with a full moral conviction and fanaticism will never stop. And that, in a way, I think that's what Starlight was. She was driven by her ideology, and she thought, I'm doing such good for these ponies, never realizing the harm she inflicted. So, it's an interesting question. My Little Pony, I feel like the mercy is often presented stronger than the justice. It's not absent, though. There is still a very strong sense of right and wrong, and punishment, letting people know that they've done wrong. And often, I think the show takes more of a character retributivism approach than a grievance. But, again, we are then drawn back to the punishment of Discord, where I think he needs to engage in a dialogue with this community to show he learned from his mistake and wants to do better. Facilitating the reformation of the uh, triad, maybe using his chaos powers to try and show them that there's a better way, using his experiences to help them, that might be a fitting task to, to give him, both to learn, help them learn a better way, but also to teach him the right way to, sh to guide someone. A trickster, like, Discord has this great ability to tear apart your life but help you realize what's really important. Unfortunately, most of the time, his selfishness completely uh, undermines that effort. And then his arrogance, assuming he's the only one uh, being the uh, trickster here, is why the triad got the upper hand on him. So, it's always a question of uh, what's the right thing to do. You don't have to... It might not always be the exact same punishment. He might not get turned to stone. But he might, his punishment might be, you have to help these others so they are no longer imprisoned in stone. And so, it's time some q and I've got the chat pulled up here. Oh, and I'm going to turn on Le Discord so that I can see what folks are asking. I'll answer questions to the best of my ability, but all I've outlined here is by copious amounts of, of reading YouTube videos, talking with people, thinking about it. There's a great deal more to learn, and I hope that people will look up uh, the theory. Uh, Murphy has done several books on justice, which I think make for good reads. And like I say, there are YouTube videos on, uh, on C.S. Lewis and his uh, views. So I think that's an excellent way if you want to learn more. So let's see here. All right. So questions. Actually, I'd be, let's see, I, t I see Torterra 1324 and Sweetie Bloom in there. Thanks for joining me, guys. Oh, oh, this is a, this is a funny uh, reference. Derek Sito, attention Bajoran workers. Gold Ducat, one of the worst tyrants of a occupation. In his eyes, he was doing nothing wrong. In his eyes, he was merciful. He was helping the Bajorans, and every day he tried to help them. And when they wouldn't help, well, he had to be extreme. That was his justification. That is what he told himself probably every night. And the horrors he inflicted on the Bajoran people all stem from him thinking he's the good guy and he's the righteous. And you can, ex you can extend that to the Cardassian culture. As Garrick said at the end of the Deep Space Nine series, our history is one of unfettered arrogance. So again, it's that fear of someone who's driven more by what they think is moral conviction, which to the rest of the world is pure sadism. <laughs> oh, that's true. I, I goofed. Torterra 1324, not 1234. I should just call him my, fr my friend who we want to redesign his OC. And Sweetie, and Sweetie Bloom wants to ship. So, yes. Oh, and Gary45, thank you. Yes, Kelpies, Kelpies, Kelpies. Let's see here. Ah, uh, what if some... Uh, Maria Cruz. Some, what if something is lawful to one person but evil to another? Oh, that, that is the imperfect system, unfortunately, which, which we, uh, in which we dwell. A lot of people can cheat within the rules, can do something cruel and still be in compliance with the law, the word of law. I'll give you a, a, a political example would, I think, distract people, but I can give you a very simple rule from, a, from Halo Reach. I was in a game w which was a complete curb stomp. 
uh, spawn camping. You couldn't even take five steps before your, your character was mowed down. So I went back and watched the replay to see what did the team do right? Well, this team was a clan of folks so big that several of their team members were, were had to be put on our team. They grabbed the power weapons and found spots on the map that were physically out of bounds but didn't trigger the out of bounds mechanic. So the team I was on was understaffed, no weapons, power weapons, and uh, no means to correct this. So it was a curb stomp. Everything that opposing team did was within the rules of the game. They didn't, they didn't trigger any rule-breaking mechanics, but was that a fair game? Was it fun? No. So yes, you can totally break the rule and, and you can totally stay true to the word of law and maybe not its spirit. And that's a whole other debate. What is the goal of the law and is the wording more important? That, that is a parallel, sometimes uh, easily mixed up with the, the goal of punishment. But yeah, the rule of law versus the spirit of law is constantly in debate. And it should be. One other thing I said to my friends and is that I, I would fear a crime so terrible, no one disagreed on the punishment. How awful would it be if no no punishment was too severe? I don't want to I don't want to picture that a crime. Hmm. What is my opinion on Call of Duty? I was intrigued. Okay, well, even Call of Duty, uh, you have main characters, especially uh, Soap and Captain Price, who work outside the law, but with the spirit of of averting terrorism, versus. Then there are other people, uh, like in the second uh, Modern Warfare, they uh, they commit horrible actions with a positive goal in mind, but it blows up and it goes terribly and actually puts the world in crisis. So there is uh, that gray area of morality there. In terms of games, I, I, I've fallen out of love with uh, Call of Duty because often the story is just a tutorial for the multiplayer, and I love a good story. So, let's see here. Uh, oh. <laughs> also, I see that uh, Brongar has drawn a uh, picture in the Discord of Mary Sue. Nope, it's Princess Celestia. I quadruple check, I just enlarged it. I'm getting, I got shouted out by so many princesses. It's Luna using the Royal Canalot voice, which is itself a punishment on a misbehaving hippogriff. I see Mary Sue because I usually expect an alicorn ant antagonist in that form. All right, just scrolling through, seeing if I can find uh, any other questions. Ah. Seraphine 666, the pithy way I've heard it stated is that mercy cannot rob justice. Hmm. That's an interesting way to put it. I'm curious about the idea that mercy is robbing justice. Uh, Lewis said that mercy and justice must kiss. I think Sweetie Bloom as a shipper will appreciate that. They must kiss. In My Little Pony, it seems like mercy, they skipped the kiss and mercy moved in and threw out all of justice's stuff. So again, it might uh, be too dominant. Let's see here. The Hylian Juggalo. Uh, saying of Starlight, that she feels she hasn't truly reformed herself for the better, and that she was forced in a way similar to how she forces others. She hasn't, she hasn't, how do I describe this? She does not view herself as better. That doesn't, but that's more her carrying a lot of guilt for past actions. She errs, but she is on a different road. She's no longer viewing herself as right by default. And yes, a copious amount of self-doubt is a part of that. Was she forced? She was shown the consequence of her actions. And that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Luna Corva, pointed out, well, just acknowledging that the act had a bad outcome doesn't necessarily mean the beliefs are wrong. That was a logical jump. But I'm not sure that she was forced. More than Twilight said, I have an opportunity for you. And I think you have a chance. Again, some... I think that would warrant a whole other discussion. Maybe there should be a panel down the line on Starlight's Reformation, the, the successes and pitfalls. That'd be an interesting topic. Folks, we have about 
it's five minutes till the next panel, and I must give them the space to stream and uh, take care of, get themselves set up. But I appreciate you taking the time to hear me ramble, to uh, hear my thoughts on this, and I hope that you're having a wonderful BabsCon. I wish I had more concrete answers for all of this. I wish I could say this is just, this is wrong, but this is going to be a debate that continues long, long into the future, and I hope people will weigh in, learn more, and be able to share their own thoughts. So, I'm Silver Quill. Thank you for watching. And now's the awkward part where I stare at the screen until they take me off. I'm afraid to say anything until they kick me off. <laughs> this is the part where I just awkwardly stare at the screen. Oh, 